Uh, allow me to introduce Martin Hagna, the Executive Director of the Gulf Coast Bird Observatory based in Lake Jackson. He assumed the director's role in January of 2017. Prior to this, Martin was the Executive Director of the Valley Nature Center, an environmental education hub with a six acre nature park located down in the lower Grand, Rio Grande Valley for 13 years. This is an area known to be a top birding and butterfly destination in the US. Their mission there was to educate both the young and young at heart about the beauty and wonders and importance of nature. He has also worked as a field biologist studying all aspects of wildlife. Martin leads birding field trips both in the US and as well as in foreign locations. Martin credits his, his love of, and knowledge of nature to his grandfather, as he was a great source of information while Martin was growing up along the west coast of Sweden. Martin has a passion for hummingbirds, and if you've ever been to the extreme hummingbird extravaganza down at GCBO, you would understand why. So take it away, Martin. Well, thank you, thank you. And thanks for having me here today. I'm, I'm glad to uh, join you guys and talk a little bit about hummingbirds. Uh, and as Robin said, I was raised in Sweden. I was born in Sweden. So we're going to do this program in Swedish today, if that's all right. Uh, well, maybe not. There is no hummingbirds over there. So, all right. So we're going to talk a lot about hummingbirds, pretty much, the whole, the whole uh, evening. And uh, uh, you guys have questions. Uh, you, can, you can type them in. Uh, I, I believe someone's going to be checking them and asking periodically, and, uh, and I'll be happy to answer a lot of questions at the end as well or any time during, so um, no problems whatsoever. I'm good at making up answers. We'll just make them up as we go. So a little bit about hummingbird facts. Uh, they're only found in the Americas. There's none in the old world. They have bee eaters and a few other things that are kind of similar, but not really. So hummingbirds are only found in, in North, Central, and South America. Uh, more than 300 species. Most of those are found in the tropics. We only have 16 species that are somewhat regular in the United States uh, and Canada. Uh, one of those breed uh, in the Eastern United States, but the majority are out West. Um, they are the smallest of birds, and the bee hummingbird weighs only two grams uh, and is about five centimeters long. That's, uh, oh, that's not much more than an inch or so, I guess. Um, they're, they're found in Cuba, and some of you might have been listening in as we were chatting in the beginning before it started. We'll be going to Cuba in October on a, on a trip, both to meet with some of the biologists that we work with over there, but also as a birding trip for GCBO. And we will be looking for the bee hummingbird. Uh, they, they, are, they have to feed constantly. They have a very high metabolism and of all of the homothermic animals, they have the highest. So they're constantly feeding. Um, that's why you see them buzzing around and they have what what we call not just territories, but they have routes. So if you see a hummingbird in your yard, in your backyard, feeding on flowers or a hummingbird feeder for that you have hung out, they very well likely are not just visiting your yard. They are they have a path that they follow all through the day if they're going to be hanging around a while. So they might go to your neighbors and the next neighbor and the next neighbor and the next neighbor feeding on the plants as they go. And the reason for that is flowers, after the nectar has been drank, it takes a little while for it to, to build back up. And so as they go to the next house and feed on those flowers, that flower in the other yard has time to basically build back up nectar. And that's how they do it. They just have this route that, uh, that they go around and around and around and around. And one of the things that can do, and, and it's not only at night, but especially when it's cold outside, freezing temperatures, they go into a torpor. And it's somewhat kind of like a bear hibernating in a way.
way. Basically, their heart rate, everything slows down uh, to one fifteenth of normal, and that that's almost dead. Uh, that is super slow um, uh, rate that they can that they can go into, and basically that's how they survive these really really cold winter nights. Um, but they also do it at, at night during regular, not maybe not as deep during regular times, so that they can you know save their energy and save their food, and they don't have to feed. Uh, in the middle of the night, since they have that really high rate of metabolism. Here's just a couple of hummingbird beauties here. We were talking about Ecuador and a few other things. Uh, you can see the beautiful colors that they have. Uh, and, and you can also see the very difference in, in bill shape. Some of them are not that long. Some of them are really, really long, and some of them are really curved. Uh, and that all has to do with um, how they feed into what flowers, uh, like the rufous-breasted hummingbird down, down in the lower right. That bird feeds on these really long, elongated trumpet-type flowers that hang downwards, and they come up from behind or below and, and put that bill in and drink. So they're adopted in different ways of bill shape as well. Now here's some others. Um, they're, you can you can see the difference in, in all of them. Some of them have really long tails, some of them have uh, little top knots, and some of them have all split tails and all sorts of things. Um, and and all, all, a lot of this is decoration um, to attract mates, um, but the bills are of course adapted for feeding. And most of these, well, the Anna's hummingbird up there, I guess you can find in North America, all the rest of them, you would have to travel south quite a ways to, to be able to see them. But uh, as we talked about, the green hermit here and the swordbill hummingbird are well adapted to feed in, in their type of flowers. Uh, you can see the swordbill hummingbird has the longest bill. Uh, we saw those in Ecuador and goodness, that bill is, is huge. Um, and, and the green hermit has a massive bill as well. They eat insects a lot as well, so they don't only rely on nectar. Uh, nectar is a, is a big portion of their, of their diet, but quite a bit of insects are gleaned either from the trees and the leaves or by hawking uh, even. They eat little gnats and uh, things like that, but the majority of the insects they eat are, are uh, small, spiders in the trees and mites and things like that. They, they eat a lot of spiders, uh, small spiders and, and similar things. Especially when they're nesting, the, they are feeding a, a higher protein diet where they need those insects to be able to feed the young as well. And their tongue is split. And I don't know if you have ever noticed that, if you've ever seen a hummingbird close enough that you could actually tell but the, the tip of their bill is split. Uh, and that is to trap the nectar and curling around it and then pulling it back in the mouth. Uh, some people think that they have like a straw, that their, that their tongue is a straw, but it's not. Uh, it is wrapped around inside their head, kind of like a tape measure is. And then they, they, re, they pull it out or they bring it out. And then when they hit the nectar source, that, that tongue splits, allowing them to trap that nectar. And then they kind of close that up and pull it back in. And that's how they drink, um, which is unlike most of anything else uh, in the bird world. A little bit about their nesting. Nests are made of moss and lichen and tiny bits of plants. Um, they basically use spider webs. The female does, for most of the hummingbirds, does the building of, of nests. Um, and once she has a, a moss and lichen and, and you know plant type nest built, she will tie, take spider webs and she will she will weave it into the actual nest. Uh, so she's she's re reinforcing the nest with spider web, holding it together. Uh, and and I've watched uh, a buff bellied hummingbird. Uh, complete a nest. We had a camera set up and we also sat and watched. It was the first time that it was documented in, in that species. 
down in the Rio Grande Valley. And one of the videographers, nature videographers, set up a platform and a, and a video camera. It was very, very interesting. And she would use a little plant material and she would put in little mosses and things like that. And then she would bring the spider web from up in the trees. And it looked like she, she was sewing, like a sewing machine. Her bill was going in and out of the, the nest with that spider web, just sticking it in there. And then they finish it off with lynchen and things like that, lichens, um, and, and camouflage it with the lichens. Um, and so you can see there in those nests that they have these little flecks of, of lichen, green colored to, to hide it. Um, those nests are about the size of a walnut. Some of them are a little bit bigger, but the birds we're talking about here, like ruby throats and black chins, uh, but they expand, so they're, they're, they're built so that they can expand. As the young gets a little bit bigger, that nest is somewhat pliable. Uh, and, and so the young will fit in there because they often have three, at least three young in there. You can see two eggs in that one, uh, but I think there's three hummingbirds maybe in the one on the right. And those eggs are about the size of Tic Tacs, those really small little white Tic Tacs. Uh, so they are tiny, tiny. Yeah, and there we go. Only female builds the nest. Um, that's often not always in the bird world, but it's it, it it's a uh, it's a in humming in the hummingbird world that is normal for them. That uh, they they build the nest, they lay the eggs, of course, incubate the egg, and they feed the young. Incubation ranges from fourteen to twenty three days, depending on the species. Um, so they're sitting on those eggs about two to three weeks. Uh, and then the young fledge, once, once that they are um, come out of the egg, uh, they fledge in about 20 to 40 days, depending on the species. So it takes a little while. So that whole process of building the nest, it took a good two weeks for her to do that, if not more, uh, before that was ready. And then hummingbirds in flight this is really interesting. Um, they, they flap their wings about 80 times per second. That is more than we can probably see. Uh, their heart rate is 250 beats per minute at rest and over 1,200 beats per minute in flight. Um, boy, if you compare that 250 beats per minute to our heart, at 250 beats per minute, our heart would, I'm sure, explode. Uh, long before that. And, and when they're flying, 1,200 beats per minute in flight, which is, that's just crazy. They can fly in all directions, as you probably know, including backwards and upside down. Uh, and they also hover, of course. And the, the flying directions, including backwards, is really important. And I think you maybe can figure out why. Um, you know, if they're feeding in a flower and they have a really long bill stuck in that flower, they have to be able to get out of that flower somehow. So they have to be able to reverse their wings and, and back out. And hovering, of course, is how they normally feed on most wildflowers by hovering in front of them. So really important trait that they can fly in all those different directions. And here's a little bit look at, at their flight. Um, to the right is the Canada goose, which flies very much like pretty much all other birds, most other birds anyhow. And, and on your left there is a hummingbird flight. And basically a, a, a general bird or a Canada goose or any other bird basically have a downstroke and an upstroke. And on the downstroke, and you can see it a little bit if this video is playing for you, uh, that, the, that the goose's wing about halfway out or so in the arm starts swaying down it it, it it basically the wing moves downwards within itself and that is how they get extra lift and so it's going down about halfway then the wings collapse a little bit and the outer tip goes even further down and then it brings it back up and it does it over and over and over again the hummingbird on the other hand because it has to be able to back up not just hover, but back up, it has to fly in a different way. And so it 
in a way, it, it uses its wing in a figure eight pattern. It's a little bit hard to see there, but it pretty much creates a figure eight pattern. And the wing goes down and it goes up, but as it does, it's also rotating and it can reverse that. So that is how they're able to fly backwards. So it's a very different uh, style of using the wing. The wing is somewhat fabricated in the same way, but it, but it does have some differences and the muscles have some differences so that it can do that. Um, and it's adopted to do that, to fly backwards. And we've got our first question, Mike, if you'll unmute and ask. Yep. Go right ahead. Mike? Okay, he may be having trouble with audio. I'll go ahead and ask it. I got it. it says, oh, okay. I, I have. It. Martin, do hummers require insects in order to fledge? Is that a, a potential problem for them that they can't get insects to uh, to ingest? Yeah, that is a good question, and that and that is true. They need that extra uh, little oomph of of food that insects give them. Uh, so it's very important during breeding season or nesting season, especially. Um, and if there is not a good, if it's a real drought year, if, it, if there, of course, a drought year affects them twice by not so many flowers and also by not so many insects. So in a bad, really hot, dry year, they might not nest as much as they would when there's a lot of insects around. That's how birds deal with life. Um, if they know that it's a bad year for food, they, they just kind of hold back. Uh, and wait for either a better time later in the year, in the summer, or they just don't breed at all. So yes, the answer is yes. All right, so we all know that hummingbirds migrate on the back of geese, right? I mean, that's just a common fact. Um, well, maybe not, but <laughs> um, back in the day, there's actually documented in books by scientists or whoever they, they were back way back when. They actually wrote this in books and they documented this. And this was a common, common fact back in the day that hummingbirds had to migrate on geese because how else would they fly all that long distance? We know that it's not right now, but that's what people actually believe. And there's other myths like that, like where do swallows uh, winter in the winter. Where do they go? Um, and there's actually documented evidence in, in books, supposedly, that they would burrow under the river into the mud and they would go to sleep in the mud. And then they would come out when springtime came again. So, so we've come a little long ways, you know, with our science and figuring out what's happily happening. But uh, so, yeah, if somebody tells you that they don't, uh, that they do migrate on the back of geese, you can say, mm, probably not. So, and we actually had somebody argue with us about that one time here at Hummingbird Banding, that they were insistent that these little birds rode on the back of geese. So it's, that theory is still apparently around. So some of these hummingbirds uh, species use lat latitudinal migration. And that is basically that they are nesting and summering way up high in the mountains. And in the winter, they come down into the valleys and, and, and spend the winter in the valleys where it's somewhat uh, warmer and more flowers. And then when summer comes around, they go back up. So they're maybe not heading north and south, but they are going up the mountain and down the mountain. Uh, so these temp some temperate species like ours, they migrate to the tropics. Um, all right, we've already established they don't ride on the back of geese. In, in, in fall, right now, pre-migration behaviors trigger mainly by the length of the day. So most species of birds, not all, but a lot of birds actually have like a built-in clock uh, in their body. And when they notice that the length of day, the, the number of hours or minutes in a day, uh, basically is, is getting shorter, to a certain amount, they know it's time to migrate. So they start to prepare. 
Uh, and they do that by increased foraging. They eat more and they can double their little weight in food. And this bird you can see actually, um, you can see that there's extra fat underneath that skin. It's kind of yellowish. It's almost like when you when you buy a chicken that's real fatty, you can you can see the yellow underneath the skin. And that's what that is. It's a, basically the same principle. Uh, and they, they, they can double that weight pretty quick uh, before they migrate because they're going to need that in that long migration. They feed off of that as they go. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about our most, most numerous uh, and only eastern breeder of hummingbirds that we have here in the United States uh, and parts of Canada. Um, it's the only one that breeds east of the Mississippi. Uh, it has the largest range of all of the North American hummingbirds. As you can see, it's basically half the country and, and then a little bit into southwestern Canada. Uh, it has an incredible, incredible migration, spends the winters mostly in Central America, but um, even a few that a few stay here on the Gulf Coast all the time. Few hang out in the Rio Grande Valley in northern Mexico, but most of them work their way down into Central America. Uh, maybe not quite as far as South America, but quite a ways down. And you can see a picture of the two up in the left of the male and the female. And I think most of you are familiar with the ruby throat hummingbird, but the male has that red gorget and the female basically is similar but plain underneath, and no red colored throat or gorget. So in the spring migration, uh, most birds are in a hurry to get north. They've, they've been spending the summer in the tropics and especially the males, because they come first most of the time, uh, they are heading north to find territory. They want to get to the best territory that they can establish or that, that they can find their, you know, girlfriend and they can build a good, or she can build a good nest uh, in a good territory that has a lot of food and shelter and so forth. So they, they a lot of them will leave from the Yucatan uh, a lot of times at night. And they would stage in the in the Yucatan area there uh, for maybe a week or just a few days, depending on the food source, uh, maybe longer even. And they will fatten up, and then they take that long, long journey across the Gulf, which can take anywhere from 18 to 30 hours. Um, and that is nonstop because there's nothing much to stop on out there. Uh, of course, there might be a ship or there might be an oil rig or something like that. But other than that. It's a straight flight. And, and since they're heading to the east, uh, you know, we do see them come through here, but not as much um, as they're heading toward the east. Uh, and that's in the spring. That's the fastest route. Um, it's not the safest route, maybe, but it is the fastest. Uh, and then in the fall, that's, this is why we see so many of them in the fall. And, and you know, starting in August, heavily into uh, September, and then it thins out in the beginning of October already. But they are now not in near the hurry that they were in the spring. They just need to get to their winter territory and they have time to do that. So they, they basically go around the Gulf, most of them. Um, it takes longer, but it is safer for the most part. They can feed on the way, they can rest on the way. Uh, and like I said, that's why we see so many of them here in, in September. And that's why we celebrate our hummingbird extravaganza here in September as well. And, and the Rockport Festival and, and the others that are in the area. This is why. Okay, so uh, a male ruby-throated hummingbird weighs four to five grams. They can fly nonstop for 26 hours or more. Uh, average speed of 25 miles an hour. It can cover 600 plus miles, which is more than enough to cross the Gulf. Of course, when it is done with that, it is exhausted and it's gonna need food right away. It needs nectar um, and somewhere to rest and somewhere to sleep. Um, and, and 
So our coastal habitats in the United States is of utmost importance to these animals. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of our coastal areas are becoming more and more um, houses and, and industry and what have you, which we need and we're going to have. It's just going to happen. But it does it does really uh, affect migrants, not just hummingbirds, but all bird species that migrate. Uh, that that layer of of green, even if it's a sliver along the coast, is of course the first thing that these guys see and that they're going to want to go land in and feed in and uh, hide in and so forth and rest. So very, very uh, important that we have coastal habitat uh, across the Gulf of Mexico. And of course, if there is a, a, a late cold front coming in in the spring, when they're going north, um, that can pretty much spell disaster for any migrant. Um, I know that as bird watchers, we kind of celebrate when there's a fallout, quote unquote, uh, when all these birds are dropping out of the sky so we can see them. Um, a lot of times fallouts are associated with bad weather, which also means that those birds have been struggling a lot and also probably means that we've lost a lot of birds out in the Gulf. Uh, you know, once they fall out of the sky or land in the water because they wear out, because they have a storm or a headwind that's too much for them, um, that's it. They can't get back out of that water. And, and not to be a, you know, a, so down on this, but there's actually at least two shark species, one that migrates through the Gulf that has built its migration on the timing of birds. So they are actually migrating through when birds are migrating overhead and they are eating all the birds that are falling into the ocean. So everything in nature is tied together. There's always some something. You, you pull a string in nature and something moves somewhere else, basically. And uh, tiger sharks who have their young in the Gulf of Mexico, move them in shore, close to shore as a nursery ground same time as spring migration to uh, rely on actually some of these birds that fall in the ocean as a food source for the young. And there's been studies done where they have, where they have been catching tiger sharks along Louisiana and other areas um, and basically pumping their stomach, not killing the shark, but taking content out of their stomach and then being able to release them unharmed uh, where they have documented dozens of species of migrants. Uh, so we know that's happening. So it's a tough life for a little bird, especially something that only weighs four to five grams, which is, I think, maybe two pennies at the most, uh, maybe one. Okay, a little bit about Eastern versus Western breeding hummingbirds. We'd already talked about the ruby throat, that's only one. Um, the majority of them are out west, so 15 species of breeding hummingbirds in the western United States. Uh, and most of that is on the other side of the Rockies, but uh, at least on this side of the Mississippi. So obviously, if you want to see more than ruby throats, for the most part, go west. Or leave your hummingbird feeders up in the wintertime. Um, I know there's a lot of people that might say that then the birds won't leave. Um, and the bird's ability to know when to migrate is pretty well solidly built into their little brain. And when those hours of daylight change, they know it's time to go. So if they want to go, they're going to go. Um, so we're not too worried about leaving those hummingbird feeders out in the winter, as long as keep them clean and keep them up. But the one thing that we have noticed uh, with the last two mega freezes that we had in the last six years or five years or whatever it is now, that yes, we do lose a good number of birds in those freezes. But those birds came here in the winter migrating to us anyhow. So if the feeders were up, I think those birds would be here anyhow. There's a lot of different, you know, thought, train of thoughts on that right now, but, and, and we probably don't know all we need to know. Um, but we feel that it's better to leave hummingbird feeders up than not, as far as that goes. And you do that, well, we talked about that. They do leave. 
Uh, we do that because there's 10 species or so of hummingbirds that regularly winter in the eastern United States. Those are Rufus and their close cousin Allens, broad-tailed, ruby-throated, black-chinned, uh, Anna's, Costa's, broad-billed, buff-bellied, um, Calio, uh, or uh, yeah. So there's those 10 species. Uh, Calliope is, I think I forgot to say the Calliope. Uh, so those 10 are, I'm not saying that they're going to be here all the time. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say that there's a ton of them around, but here at GCBO, we normally have at least a few Rufus every winter, maybe an Allens. Uh, we normally have a ruby throat or a black chin, or maybe both, one or two of each, maybe. We've had Annas here that we banded, uh, and we regularly have buff belly hummingbirds in the winter as well. Um, so a lot of times it depends on your habitat around your house or where you live, whether you will have wintering hummingbirds, but they are definitely all up and down the Texas coast in the winter or in a lot of portions of Texas period, all through Texas in the winter. And uh, here's the pictures of the males. I should have put in some female pictures in here, but I didn't, I need to fix that. But there's your Rufus, the male adult Rufus hummingbird up in the left, and the closely related cousin, the Allens. And you can see it has a green back compared to the Rufus, which has a red back. However, just to mess with us, there's a small percentage of Rufus that have green backs as well. So you can't go by that alone. Uh, it's very hard to identify them in the field. Uh, if they have a really bright green back like that, and uh, you, you probably have a good point in saying, I probably have an Allens, but you can't really be sure unless you can count and look at the tail feathers and what pattern they are and what amount of white and so forth, uh, which is hard to do in the field. Uh, the broad tails are fairly common winter, winter residents here, uh, not in big numbers, but in small numbers. Uh, I know that there's a couple of yards in Lake Jackson that, that have had them on and off uh, the last, you know, many years. Uh, ruby throats and black chin also will, in very small numbers, spend a winter with us. As, uh, as will the calliope and the anas. And we did band an anas hummingbird here last winter. Um, and costas and broadbills and buff belly. Broadbills are pretty rare. Uh, costas are pretty rare. Uh, calliope are pretty rare as well. Those are probably the three rarest calliope, costas, and broadbills. The buff bellied is a weird creature because that's really a tropical species. Um, when you say buff bellied hummingbird, people think of the Rio Grande Valley, Mexico, and South. And what, what we have found is that for some reason, buff bellies are traveling north along the coast in the winter and end up up here. They don't go much further, but they can get into Louisiana at times for the winter, uh, along the coast mainly. Uh, Victoria maybe as far inland as maybe they go or so. Um, and, and for some reason, there's a, at least a part of the population that come north and spend the winter with us. And well, here's the ruby-throated female and a black chin female. Some people say you can't tell them apart in the field, um, but you actually can. Um, it's not easy, I'm not saying that, but if you're able to get either a good picture or if they sit still for you a length of time, you can start picking out the different field marks that, that make them different. These two birds are, they do look very different body-wise, in these pictures, they're really not. This is an angle uh, and sunlight and so forth that, that, that changes the perspective a little bit of what the birds really look like in a way because one is facing a little different than the other. Uh, but if you look on the ruby-throated, uh, more of a green sheen to the top of the head. The bill is shorter. Um, 
And then the other thing that is different is the length of the wing. If you look at the tip of the, the little black tip of the wing, it goes almost to the tip of the tail, sometimes all the way to the tip of the tail. It also looks like it's narrow. It's shaped narrower, a little bit like the sword. And then when you look at the black chin and compare those same things, the, the, the female here has a longer bill. It has a grayer head. And it's and its tip of the wing doesn't go near as far down the tail, and it's also shaped a little bit like a club, so it's it's rounder. It's not so pointy. Those are all good field marks to look for to to distinguish. Probably our, you know, some of our hardest to identify uh, female uh, hummingbirds here: ruby throated and black chin. If you just get a quick look. None of that probably matters and probably helps you. But if you get a really good look and they're sitting perched and maybe you're looking through binoculars or you get a really good view or you get pictures, then you can probably discern between the two. Um, the one thing to remember in the bird world is that not everything is constant. Um, those bills can be variable. The ruby throat can have a little bit longer bill sometimes and the black chin can have a little bit shorter sometimes. So you have to look at the overall pictures. You have to see all those field marks. And if you see all three field marks and they all jive or four field marks um, on each bird, then you can probably figure out what it is. All right. And then this is probably our most common winter bird here, the Rufus hummingbird. There's probably more Rufus hummingbirds wintering in our area than any of the other species. Um, and the male on the left there and the female on the lower right uh, or center. And you can see that the male has a lot more rufous on it. The picture there doesn't show it's bright orangey gorget, reddish orange gorget. Uh, and that is because uh, those feathers are black. They don't really have color. It's not until the bird turns its head into the sun and the light refracts through kind of like a prism through the feathers that the color shows. Um, and so there is no red feathers. If you were to, if he was to lose a feather and it fall down, it would be dark, uh, grayish, black, some somewhere in there. And not until you put it in the right light does that red color or pink or orange or whatever color that that species of hummingbird has, will it show up. And this is true for other birds as well. Blue jays are not blue. Blue jays are kind of blackish, grayish. It's not until the light hits those blue feathers that they turn blue. And there is really very, if any, blue color in, in, on birds in nature. It doesn't exist. It's not until the sun hits those feathers correctly um, that they turn blue on a lot of those blue species. And, and that's why if you look at a, say, a blue jay in a hedge in the dark, it looks black, it looks dark. There's no blue. Um, and, and so the same goes for the, the male feathers or even females that have a little bit. You can see that the female ruf rufus here has a little bit of coloration on the throat. And that will be speckly red, orangey color, even though she's a female. The older females often develop a little bit of that in many of the species. So some people say, well, it's a young. Well, it might be, but it can also be a female because they will develop a little bit of a gorget or a few speckled feathers uh, on their throat. Kind of like a indigo bunting female will have some blue feathers, especially in her tail and, 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 and uh, upper body and so forth as they get older. Hey, Martin, we have another question. All right. Okay, Robin, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Hey, Martin, what plants would these wintering hummingbirds be looking for? So what should we have in our garden that might still be blooming that they we, would? Yeah, we will get to that, I promise. I got a few slides coming up that'll, that'll answer your question. Um, yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about plants towards the end of the talk here in a little bit. 
Uh, in January 2010, we had a wintering female Rufus hummingbird that was banded in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, and we know this because some of our banders here, the looking bills have banned hummingbirds, uh, Sue Heath have banned hummingbirds and others have banded some of these birds and these birds returned. Uh, also in 2010, we had a bird that was caught on its breeding grounds near uh, Chenga Bay, Alaska. It's more than 3,500 miles away. Uh, longest distance between banding, banded and recaptured ever recorded for any hominid I mean, species. And that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that might not be the route that they took directly like that. No bird flies, uh, you know, in a straight line, but for the most part, you can see the two destinations of where that hummingbird came from and went to uh, after it was banded, so. A few more amazing facts. Uh, I did not name Big Mama, somebody else did. Uh, <laughs> But a female Rufus was banded in a backyard here in Lake Jackson and returned for nine winters. They're very site fidelic. They come back to the same spot. They come back to the same feeder. And we, we know that from birds that have been banded and they hover outside a window where a feeder normally hangs if that feeder isn't there a year later. Um, a female Rufus was banded in Enterprise, Alabama, returned for nine winters as well. Uh, Black Chin, banded in Lake Jackson, has returned for 10 winters. Excuse me. And two ruby throats, one banded in Tallahassee and one in Lakeland, Florida, returned for seven winters. And the list goes on and on and on. So here we go. Here we're going to talk a little bit about some of the plants. I'm not a plant expert. Um, some of you might know more about certain plants than I do, but obviously the picture on the left is different than the picture on the right. And <laughs> a hummingbird is going to come to the picture on the right long before it goes to the, to the left. So it's important to have a lot of native uh, flowering habitat for the birds, not just the feeders. The feeders is to augment them, and especially in the winter, um, when, when um, there's not as many flowers out and it's not as, uh, not near as much food available, so to speak. Those feeders are there to augment that. So some of the flowering plants, and not all of these are native to our area, but they're adapted and they grow well and they do well. Uh, remember that most hummingbirds like the color red. When they see things, they see it different than we do. They have some ultraviolet vision. So a Turk's cap that's red to us is actually not red to them. It's a different color. It's a different shade, but whatever shade that is, Red is the shade that they prefer. <laughs> so if you can get red porterweed, uh, if you can get Drummond's Turk's cap, it's the Drummond's Turk's cap is much better than the um, than than the Southern or the Mexican or whatever they want to call it. The Drummond's Turk's cap. Let's see if I have. Yeah, I do. So we'll we'll talk more about that. But the porterweed, the Turk's cap shrimp plant is really good. Fire spike, uh, butylon, pentas, uh, clematis, salvias are especially good, malias and firebush. Those are all good. Um, and you can take a picture with your phone if you wanna, or write them down, but uh, those are all really good plants for hummingbirds. And some of them will bl bloom into winter. Um, they're especially good in migration as well for hummingbirds. Porterweed, although I have a blue picture here, that they would prefer the red. The shrimp plants, they really like feeding on shrimp plant. And shrimp plant grows pretty well here, and so does porterweed. Uh, the native Turk's cap, which is called Drummond's, compared to the tropical Turk's cap, 
the, the native Turks cap have much smaller red flowers. And as you can see, they grow upright. Um, the tropical Turks cap, I'm not saying it's, it, it's not worth it, but the Drummonds is much better at feeding a hummingbird with the bill of a ruby throat or our size hummingbirds. Um, that's a much bigger flower and it hangs downwards. Our hummingbirds that live here in the winter are much better at feeding in smaller flowers that are upright or at least straight out. So the tropical Turks cap just isn't as good uh, as the native Drummond's Turks cap is. I'm not saying don't plant the tropical Turks cap. I'm just saying if you have a choice and you can only plant one, plant the native Drummond's. Pardon, we've got a comment from Doris Hurd. Doris, if you'll unmute and um, go ahead and talk about that. Uh, okay, I hope you can hear me. Yep. Yes. Years ago, George Regman told me that the reason the Turks cap is so popular is it renews its nectar almost immediately after one drinks, then it's ready for the next one, and which I thought was interesting. Uh, and just another thing I wanted to comment on, uh, years ago, I went up to Lake Houston and a lady that had all these hummingbird feeders out, she said, put them on the north side of your house in the uh, fall when they're coming back from the north, make sure your feeders are on the north side. She had hundreds of hummingbirds coming uh, during September. Anyways, that's my comment. So, anyways, I hope, but George is the one Regman told me about the uh, Turks cap, the native one, renewing its nectar almost immediately. Yeah, those are good comments, and, and they are faster than many other plants uh, at, at renewing their nectar. That's very, that's good, good point. Uh, another reason to use the native Drummond's Turks cap over the other. Uh, and, and Turks cap will grow in the sun, it'll grow in the shade. Um, it blooms better in the sun uh, with some partial shade. Uh, the, it'll flower better, I should say. So. And Martin, we have another question. Yeah. Is that, is that Deb Valdez? Do you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure, I can unmute. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I just wonder, I, I think you guys have a great nursery, native plant nursery. Are you selling any of these? pollinator plants, I mean, any of these plants in your nursery right now, or will you have them? Yeah, good question. And, and I wish the answer was a resounding yes, but between COVID and the freezes and at least one hurricane that hit straight on here, um, our nursery is not doing very well. Uh, we didn't have volunteers in there for a long time during COVID. Then those freezes hit and pretty much devastated it. We have pieced it back together. Um, there's a lot of, during, during XHX, which is coming up soon, it's open, it'll be open to the public. We'll, we'll sell what we have, but there's very little Turks cap uh, or a lot of these other things available, unfortunately. We wish there was, but there's not gonna be a lot. There's a lot of plants still, but a lot of them aren't really nectaring hummingbird plants. And a lot of them, were brought in by volunteers and are not really all that native. Um, and so we will be liquidating those um, during XA checks for very, you know, like two bucks or something if people want to come buy them for whatever reason. Um, but unfortunately, we will not have a lot of hummingbird plants this year. We've got another comment. What, well, Linda? Oh yeah, I was just saying that the, the Clear Lake Chapter of Native Plant Society will have plenty of the native Turks cap for sale this fall in October, if people want to come by for that. That'd be great. Yeah, it's a good source. Uh, and there's a couple of nurseries, you know, Houston Audubon has a nursery. There's a couple of others uh, closer to the Houston area, unfortunately, but, uh, or on, on the south, West side of Houston is two different ones that oftentimes have Turks cap and, and a lot of these other hummingbird type plants um, that are good. Uh, salvias are normally wonderful and especially the one on the left, which is tropical or red salvia. Um, the tropical salvia is a great sage uh, that 
it's the right color, has the right size flower. Hummingbirds love to feed on it. Um, so I, I plant a lot of that here. We have a lot of it in the yard, those kind of things. Um, and then when we come to feeders, uh, there's a million kinds of feeders out there. Um, you know, there's every shape and, and, and flavor. What I will tell you is buy something that comes apart easily, that you can clean easily. Uh, don't buy something if it doesn't come apart or you can't get a brush in there um, very easy because then you can't clean it very easy. Um, let me see. Yeah, we have, uh, we have feeders here for sale. We will have them during XHX, but you can buy any feeder, you know, Walmart, any, any brand. It doesn't matter how expensive they are per se, as long as they come apart. You can see how they, these come apart here on the bottom uh, within a moment's note, you know, you seconds, you can pull it apart and then you can scrub it inside. And it's very important because you'd be cleaning them at least once every week in the winter months and at least twice during the summer uh, because they will go rancid, that liquid will go bad. And so it's very, very, very important that if you are gonna leave feeders out, clean them. It's more important to do that than having them up. If you're not gonna be cleaning them and they go bad, you might as well take them down because that's gonna do more harm than good for the birds. So be, be very diligent about cleaning your feeders uh, regularly, at least twice a week during the summer and um, keep them clean. If they get moldy, um, we do use a bleach solution, water and bleach that we pour in them and let them sit. And then we scrub them, um, you know, with a bottle brush and hot water really good and rinse them 10 times and make sure that bleach is out of there and then let them dry. Uh, so you can do that if you need to. But if you clean them often enough, you'll find that you can probably keep ahead of them getting moldy. And that's more important, I think. Um, you can use four to one or three to one. So that's four parts, regular tap water, one part, regular white granular sugar. Do not use brown sugar or any sugar substitute or syrup or anything else. White granular sugar, regular sugar. Uh, anything else can become to toxic to birds. Um, a lot of people use that four to one mixture. And then in winter or right during migration, they switch up to a three parts water, one part sugar to make it a little bit more stronger, so to speak, a little more oomph in it. Uh, and that is to help those birds that are migrating or wintering here when it's really cold outside, gives them a little extra. Um, we don't often change the mixture here, but a lot of people do and it does, it's fine. We never use the pre-made mixes you can buy in the store. Uh, they all pretty much have red food dye in them. Uh, we don't use red food dye. Red food dye is not good for humans. So imagine what it might might do to a little tiny hummingbird that's really tiny and, and, uh, and, uh, and you know drinks that. So we do not recommend the mixes or the red food dye. There's normally enough red on the hummingbird plant, I mean, on the uh, hummingbird feeder as it is. That's why they're red. They have that color already. And if your feeder doesn't have red, uh, you can paint part of the lid red. You can hang some red ribbons from the bottom, anything to attract the hummingbird when they see that red. Okay, and here is extreme hummingbird extravaganza. So, this is um, two Saturdays in September. This, I think, is our 26th year of doing this. Um, I have not been here that whole time, but, but Saturday, September 16th and 23rd from 8 a.m. to noon. Um, this, the earlier you get here, the better, because it's cooler, but also we catch more birds earlier in the morning than we do, say, at 11 or 12. And if you want to help GCBO and symbolically adopt a hummingbird. And no, I'm sorry, you don't get to take it home, but you will get a piece of paper that has a band number on it. Uh, you can even name the bird and we'll put it on there if you want. And then if that bird is ever caught anywhere else, 
you will get an email saying that, hey, your bird is in, in uh, Yucatan uh, or Chicago or wherever they happen to be. But uh, if you want to do that, coming earlier is better because oftentimes we will sell out adoptions before the, the morning is over. So get in line for those adoptions early if you want to. But you can see all the hummingbirds that are migrating through here in fall at the extravaganza. Learn about them. Um, and, and you can watch the hummingbird banding up close. And like I said, you can uh, uh, adopt one. And if you do adopt one, you will get to release it. They will place the hummingbird in your open hand and let it fly from your hand. So, And you can also volunteer. Uh, we're always looking for volunteers for this event. Uh, I know you guys are a little further away than some, but but uh, we would love to have you help. You can call Celeste here at GCBO or email Celeste. You can look it up on the website um, and get in touch with us here. And uh, we would love to have your help. All right. Well, that is the bulk of the presentation. And I am happy to open it up for questions if there's any others. Hey, does anybody have any questions? You wanna unmute and ask your question, Janet? Hi, I can't remember if you said they actually feed at night. Uh, no, not normally. They normally sleep at night. They are normally daytime creatures. So most of the time they will be sleeping at night except for when they're migrating, they oftentimes migrate at night but because it's just safer. Um, for the most part, they sleep at night and don't really feed much past dusk. And you, you will oftentimes see hummingbirds coming in, you know, before dusk. And that's the last time you see them for the evening. Right, so if I have a friend of my house, then is it a summer resident or is it an early migrant right now? It could be both right now. Um, most likely it is a um, migrant because they are starting to push in now, but you could have had a summer resident. Have you seen it all summer or just recently? Recently. Yeah, so it's probably an early migrant. They're starting to push through right about now. So most most likely it's, it's a migrant. I've got a question from Deb again. Yeah, hi. I've never had them actually come to my winter feeder. So I put them up one winter and never had any luck. Yeah, it 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 kind of depends on where you are sometimes. And if there's if there's not a lot of habitat or a lot of good food sources around your area, they they might be might take longer or they might never show up. Um <laughs> it, it has to do with location, I think, quite a bit. Um there has to be some flowering plants around that they can see when they're traveling through. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't give up. I mean, keep. I don't know how long you've tried for them, but I would, you know, make, make sure you have flowering plants if you can, Turk's cap or something that's flowering uh, in the winter and, and uh, leave those feeders where they're visible. Um, you know, some people hang them under an eave where they're not as, and that's great because it protects them. But if the bird can't see them readily, they might not come to it. So you might even hang a dummy feeder without food out in the sun and then have one near it that has, you know, food in it. That's a good, good idea. Mm -hmm. Hey, Joe Bryan, you want to give your comment? Yes. Uh, there you go. Uh, I took my granddaughter there at her class outing about 10 years ago. And yeah. uh, we got to, both, both of us got to hold a newly banded hummingbird and feel those parts just go like a vibrator. And yeah. uh, I got good plants and most of them are still living there. It was about 10 years ago. Wonderful. She was Thank like you. in the uh, fifth grade and uh, she's like 22 now. Well, it's time for y'all to come back. <laughs> oh, I've been back. I have volunteered there in the nursery in the past. Right. Thank you. Appreciate that. With with the uh, uh, wetland team. 
the stormwater team. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. Wonderful. Thank you all very much. Okay. Okay, Martin, I want to thank you for a great, everybody is, is writing excellent presentation, great presentation, all the, all the praises are coming through on chat, and uh, the pictures that you provided were amazing, and I love the wing thing, that was really super cool, and, uh, and for those of you who haven't gone to the Hummingbird Extravaganza, I volunteered, and yes, he's right, if you're not there first thing in the morning, we run out of hummingbirds by about 10 or 11 o'clock. So be there yeah. early. <laughs> yeah, you can maybe still, you know, adopt a cardinal, but that might not be as, you know. As it's fun. not as fun. <laughs> you, you can't hold a cardinal. We won't let you because they bite. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But thank you so much for your time and your efforts. And GCBO is a, an amazing organization. So we're really happy you're there. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm really glad to be here. And I, I want to thank you guys for everything that you all do, because I know you guys, you know, all the volunteer work that you do, all these organizations wouldn't be around if it wasn't for you guys. And I say that from our organization as well, because the amount of volunteer work that, that you guys and other master naturalists do is, is amazing. We would not be able to do near the work that we do without you guys. So thank you.